we were mentioning earlier, uh, if you know the history of this, that over the last couple of years, most of the governors across the United States have said that they wish they could have more control over the refugee resettlement program. Not because anybody is, uh, is opposed to the program 100% just saying we've got to end it for good forever, but because there's concerns about security. In fact, uh, right after some of the governors, earliest governors to do that, one was uh, John Kasich in Ohio, the following day, Governor Butch Otter was on the air with us here at KLIX, and he said the same thing, uh, that they would like more control in the process, which they don't have right now, but that could be changing because of a bill introduced by a couple of folks in Washington, one of them being U.S. Representative Raul Labrador from Idaho, uh, that would give some more input to those governments uh, versus having it all come from the top down. Uh, it's 917. First of all, Representative, welcome back to our program. It's great to be on your show. Thanks for having me. There was a lengthy piece uh, that you and Bob Goodlatte from Virginia wrote for the Washington Times about this yesterday. And uh, one thing that you mentioned in there was that if we actually were able to have public input on this, uh, that we would see that the public as well, not necessarily opposed overwhelmingly to the program, but just believes that we need a little bit more oversight on what goes on. Absolutely. I, I remain committed to the important humanitarian mission of assisting refugees. I think that's something important that the United States have done for, has done for many years. But what we need is we need reforms of, of the program. Uh, my belief is that the most important factor when it comes to the refugee program is to ensure the safety and security of the American people. This is what many people in Congress forget about. Our immigration system, our refugee system, all those things, the number one uh, concern we should have is the safety and security of the American people. I support the refugee program, but it needs to be modernized. It needs to keep up with some of the security challenges of today's world. Uh, there's already, as you know, documented cases of terrorists infiltrating a refugee program, and with ISIS vowing to explo exploit it uh, further, I think it's the, the time for congressional action is, is now. When, when developing this bill, and as I understand, this is not the first time you've worked on this, uh, I, I, has there been a lot of support in Washington, or have people been a little bit reticent about getting on board? So there's a lot of support on the Republican side, and there's been a lot of ugly rhetoric on the other side of, about this bill. Uh, you know, n none of us uh, want to stop the refugee program. I think there's some humanitarian reasons to have a refugee program. But I think when, when you have the FBI director, who's no longer the FBI director, but who at the time um, testified in our committee, and, and I asked him the question specifically, can you assure the people of Idaho that the people that are coming to Idaho from Syria and some of these other countries that we have less information about, that they have been properly vetted? His answer was no. He says that he couldn't give us that assurance. And... Um, and you have to look at the difference between different countries. We, we have a lot of intelligence information in countries like Iraq. If you remember, Iraq had a, a modern system of laws, had a modern system, uh, a modern criminal system. They, they had some, you know, enough information about people. And then we have also had a long experience with the people in Iraq who helped us during the war. In Syria, they don't have that kind of system. They don't have a criminal justice system that, that is viable. We don't have enough intelligence in the people that are there. We know that ISIS and other terrorist groups have vowed to infiltrate the Syrian community so they can come to the United States. Those are things that we should be very concerned about. So just because you have humanitarian compassion for what's happening in the world doesn't mean that you have to make inappropriate decisions and unsafe decisions for the safety and security of our citizens. The, the current process, the current law, as I understand it, has, has been around a very, very long time, and no one has ever really sat down and reviewed it. That is, it, it, it really, it's very top-down. It comes out of what, uh, the U.N. through the president, uh, but there's very little obvious control at any level. Um, uh, people can't just throw up a barrier and say, no, we don't want it here, because then they would be in violation of current law. Correct. And, and what we're trying to do is to make the system stronger. Uh, we need to make lasting reforms that modernize the program and that align it and make it fit within the, the 21st century. I, you know, this has been my mantra about immigration in general. We have a system that was devised in the 1950s for the most part. 
And we, we are in a new century. We need to look at, at, at the new concerns that we have, the new needs that the United States has. And as, as we're looking to reform the immigration system and specifically the refugee program, we need to look at, at our safety and security concerns and, and the needs of the American people. So what the bill does is it does set the statutory ceiling at, of refugees to 50,000. But, but most importantly, it, it uh, prevents the president, the executive, from, from shifting that, that number. It's right now under the law, the law says that this, its ceiling is set, I, I believe it's at 60,000. Uh, but the president can reset it at any time. And he's supposed to do it in consultation with, with Congress. But all he does, his consultation right now in the past has been sent, he sends us a letter that says that he's going to increase the number. Well, now it's going to have to be approved by Congress. If he wants, if any president of any party wants to increase the number of refugees coming to the United States, it has to be, it has to be approved by Congress. The other thing that it does is what you mentioned earlier. It allows local communities and municipalities to decide if they want to have more refugees in their communities. You know your area has been very welcoming to refugees, and I think they have done a very good job with refugees. But at some point, the community may decide that they don't want more people coming uh, as refugees to, to the area. But that's something that that is that you not only are going to have consultation with Congress, you're going to have consultation and, and approval of the local communities. The governors and the local municipalities will decide whether they want to approve. Right now, it's a, an NGO that's making that decision. So NGOs, you know, these uh, non-governmental organizations are making policy decisions for the United States, and, and I just don't think that's appropriate. Our guest is uh, U.S. Representative Raul Labrador. It's 923, and you're listening to News Radio 1310 KLIX and News Radio 1310.com. We're at 65. Uh, Bill Cowley with you as well on Top Story this morning. What gets a lot of people, I think, really, though, uh, uh, riled up is this notion that we see them being settled in a lot of smaller communities and rural areas around the country, but they're not being settled in McLean, Virginia, where, yeah. gosh, you have a lot of people who work in the House and Senate and uh, lobbyists and the like. Uh, and so the, the program seems to be uh, built to, to put people in communities where most of the people are already forgotten. Mm-hmm. Well, and, and that's one of the concerns that we have. And now, there, there is a rational reason for bringing people to Twin Falls as opposed to McLean, Virginia. In, in Twin Falls, you know, it's a safer community, all those things. I mean, there, there are good rational reasons for doing that. But that's why I think it's so important that the local community have an input on, on what's happening, that it's just not decided in Washington, D.C., or in New York at the U.N., or at, at some NGO abroad and outside of the United States. I think it's important that the local community have the input, that, that uh, the, you know, the members of the community decide if they want to welcome uh, refugees. And I, and I think you, your community has been uh, very welcoming in the past, and I think they will com- continue to be. There was a story in the Washington Post I saw online last night about a county in Indiana where they don't have enough labor to work in various factories. So that community could, if it had a say in this, say, all right, we'll take people in as refugees because we need the labor. The county has a 2% unemployment rate. But but in some communities, it is true that the burden's already pretty heavy, and it's a huge burden on the social services as well. Absolutely. You know, and, and you know, I, I mentioned this yesterday at the hearing that, that we had, but the former Assistant Secretary for Population, Refugees, and Migration under the Obama administration, he told the Immigration Subcommittee, she told the Immigration Subcommittee last year that the federal government has the right to resettle refugees. And she said the, the support of the American people very much at the level of communities and societies and towns to come forward and help those re- refugees is important. But then she turned around and said that she refused, she refused to answer the question that if a community does not want to resettle the refugees, that the government will not resettle them in that community. So they, they were talking out of both sides of their mouth. They were saying that the, the local support is important, and they're supposed to, you know, to, to talk to the local communities, but it really won't matter in the end because they're the ones who decide 
uh, how to resettle uh, these refugees. And, and I just think that's totally inappropriate. And you're right. We need to look at the needs of the community. There are some communities that might need it uh, more than others. Uh, you know, and I don't want to take away from the great contributions that refugees have made to our community. I think this is not an anti-refugee bill. This is a very pro-refugee bill. We, we want to make sure that we just modernize the refugee program and make it better for this century. We've got about a minute left. I, I understand that after some of the recent attacks in Britain, it was uh, announced that there were several thousand people on a, a basically a terrorist watch list. That's the, the real concern that I have and I guess that most of my neighbors have. Yeah, absolutely. We, the, the policy of the United States uh, vis-a-vis immigration, vis-a-vis refugees, vis-a-vis any of these things that we're doing should be about the safety and security of the United States. That is the number one priority. That is my number one priority. And I want to make sure that the people of Idaho and the people of the United States are always feeling safe and secure and that we're doing everything that's necessary to vet and to confirm that the people that are coming to the United States are people that are going to contribute to our society and are going to make our society better. Representative Labrador, we want to thank you much, and we'll look forward to talking to you again soon. Thank you so much. Take care. Representative Raul Labrador joining us this morning. He and colleague Representative Bob Goodlatte from Virginia have put together a bill that would make some changes in the refugee resettlement program Uh, That bill would give greater control to state and local governments as to who comes to their communities, numbers and the like, and the decision-making process would be, because right now, nobody has that ability. You're just told these people are coming here, you know, make room, and we'll deal with it at that point. It's 928. We have a short break coming up in just a moment, about one minute away. Also, we're going to be joined by, uh, actually, a political ally of Representative Labrador, Uh, In fact, we were talking about that off air before uh, the representative uh, joined us uh, live this morning. But Bjorn Bjorn Handine, who is a a committeeman, a Republican committeeman from up in northern Idaho, is going to be joining us in a few minutes. And he's going to be talking about a proposal that has been floated by his Republican committee, uh, which objects to a bill that was put together in the Senate by U.S. Senator Mike Crapo a Russia sanctions bill, and they believe there's too much attention being paid to Russia, Russia, Russia versus America first. And uh, that'll be actually heard, I'm told, at a committee meeting next week. That's on the way in just a few minutes. I do want to mention our friends at Mount Harrison Audiology this morning. If you're listening to the show, thank you. If you're struggling, you may need someone to check your hearing, and we recommend Dr. Christine Pickup. Why choose Mount Harrison Audiology? Service. Did you know Dr. Pickup offers communication skills classes and oral rehab that you can use at home? At Mount Harrison Audiology, she knows that hearing aids are only part of the equation. True hearing health care should include tools and techniques that enhance communication for you and your loved ones. Trust your hearing to Dr. Pickup at Mount Harrison Audiology, the number 208 312 That's 312-0957. We've got 66 at 930. 